and normally they come up really short in these situations. So how do you get over that hump? Um, that's going to be really indicative of what they do on the field, whether it's stopping the run, understanding where Brock Bowers is in the most crucial moments of the game, and really like not just playing him like a normal person, but really understanding the situation overrides everything else. And that's what Kentucky has to realize on the defensive end. And then offensively, they got to find a way to kind of be some kind of dual threat. They have to be able to run the football effectively, but also be able to throw the ball as well. You're not going to be able to just line up and blow Georgia off the ball. And Georgia's going to fit the run better, much, much better than what Florida did. And uh, Kentucky saw a hole in Florida's defense and continued to just exploit that hole. Um, and Ray Davis is a really good, talented running back, so he can really make you pay uh, if you do not do those little things well. And I don't think Georgia's going to allow Kentucky to just turn around and hand it off to Ray Davis. So it's going to come on the arm of Devin Leary. And can, can he make plays? Uh, not only throw the ball accurately, but then also the wide receivers got to catch it, which Kentucky has dropped the ball a lot this year in those situations. Roman, you've uh, obviously got some experience uh, playing against great tight ends. What what does it take to stop a great tight end like a Brock Bowers? Um, like I said, you got to understand the situation when they're trying to use him, what he does at different places on the field. Now, that's a lot saying coming from a former professional. Like, I understand those things. Uh, that doesn't always happen on Saturday. So they just kind of play it sometimes. Um, but it's going to come. It's going to take a total team effort. You're going to have some linebackers trying to be up under him. Uh, Trevin Wallace is a really athletic linebacker at Kentucky that can fly around, that can make plays. And then also the safeties on the other back end of it saying, hey, we have certain responsibilities. We got to keep our eyes on this guy. And then when you get your opportunity, you got to be able to tackle this guy. He breaks more tackles than anybody else. So he is Georgia's playmaker. He is the guy that Georgia finds a way to get the ball in the most crucial situations. So all those things kind of wrapped up into one gives Kentucky a chance and Kentucky plays so smart and Kentucky's a team that knows who they are and when you have a team that knows who they are they don't waver in tough situations they only continue to just stay right down it and the, on, the, on the opposite end Georgia does as well so it's going to be a really really unique battle to see and I think the most important thing that I think Kentucky has a chance is that because Georgia has started off so slow in every game so if you start off slow again and Kentucky's able to have any type of success early, now you're in for a real battle. And uh, can anybody get up more than seven points or 10 points versus Georgia and actually make them feel uncomfortable? Talking to Georgia defensive players, they don't feel like that they've played up to their standard yet. You know, what, what do you see in that Georgia defense um, you know, that, that may be a drop off from, you know, the last few years to now? Well, that's easy. I mean, the whole D-line's not affiliated. We're all with the Philadelphia <laughs> Eagles. Like, they, they just don't have that. And so the guys that are playing now for Georgia, we're all now, we used to be all the guys in the pros backups. And so the depth of piece will, another, will be another thing that you kind of got to be a little bit concerned with. But, I mean, you don't have Jalen Carter. You don't have Jordan Davis. You don't have the number one overall pick who I, I think of last and all of these things, and, uh, you know, Nolan Smith. So uh, just understanding that, it is a natural tendency to have a drop back or a drop off. But uh, Georgia, they got to figure out how to, they're going to be fine. And sometimes I think this Georgia team has to find a way to score on defense or on special teams to kind of jumpstart their offense at times. Their offense just, for whatever reason, you know, I, I told somebody earlier, I feel like they play with their food too much. You know, like my, my kid, they're playing with their food too much early, allowing these teams to kind of stick around and get confidence. They can't allow that to happen with Kentucky because Kentucky's a team that knows who they are. And if you give them more and more confidence, they're going to make this game closer and closer. And then next, you know, the crowd's not as into it. People on their nerves or on their pins and needles. Uh, it's tough being a fan in those type of situations. So if Georgia wants to win this game, they should get out to a fast start. If they do that, I, I don't think they, Kentucky can keep up with it. You said you thought that Georgia would fit the run better against Ray. So what is the key for Kentucky to be able to throw the ball effectively with Leary from what you've seen against the Georgia secondary? Well, the receivers got to catch it, number one. The receivers have got to catch the football. And Devin Leary's got to be smart with the football. Um, if he doesn't turn the football over and the receivers catch the ball, it's, it's advantage Kentucky. Kentucky has some really talented wide receivers on the outside, but they're not being utilized in the fact of when they're throwing it to them, they're not catching it. It's just whatever, for whatever reason, they're just not on the same page. And it'll be really interesting to see how that matchup goes, knowing that Georgia's going to play tight man-to-man -man coverage and they're going to challenge these guys uh, because they know they got to stop this run. So they're going to have eight guys, nine guys ready to stop the, uh, stop the run game. And from that point on, Kentucky has to find a way to win their one-on-ones on the outside. We know that the polls say Georgia's number one, but clearly there's been times Georgia hasn't looked like that. When you look at the SEC, if I ask you for a 10,000-foot view near the midway point, what do you see in the league in terms of potential championship contenders outside of Georgia? Uh, 
do you want me to name teams or you yeah. Want me to, uh, yeah take me there i think i think balma has a chance uh texas a m is playing well and you know they can win it because of their d-line um lsu has a a national championship offense but a non-power five defense <laughs> and you know you old miss won a big game and so they have a chance now but they need help and so the big takeaway for me is that I said at the beginning of the year, I thought this was going to be the most diverse SEC conference I had seen since I've been working for this company. And uh, it's really ringing true right now. And it's literally a week to week basis. Like it's a week to week job right now. You think a team's good and they lose. You think a team that lost, they stink. And no, no and actually they're good now. So that is what the SEC is as a whole. And nobody would have thought that after in going into week six that the three undefeated teams will all be in the East. So it's just really, really diverse. It does not look like anywhere we thought we would be. But at the end of the day, you still have those teams at the top that we kind of thought would be there, which is Texas A&M, Alabama, which I did, was not on Texas A&M. I cannot take any credit for that. Um, I'm still trying to learn how to trust them. And, um, and Ole Miss had a chance as well. So it's, it's still those teams. And uh, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see how Alabama continues to grow in the right direction. I thought that was a really, really big win for them last week versus Ole Miss. Uh, a really big statement win for them going forward, Ole Miss and Mississippi State. So um, we'll, we'll see how that's going to be. But it's like I said, it's a week-to-week -week game right now, almost like the NFL. Like every game counts every Sunday. You can't take any any breaks because the moment you chill is the moment you lose. When, when it has been a week-to-week -week game and Georgia's managed to win it all, you know, the, all their games up to this point, obviously the competition hasn't been – that of you know some of those West teams, but what what does that say about Georgia and just their ability to, to find ways to win? Uh, the, the best teams always do. Good teams always find ways to win games, no matter what the situation. Uh, and they find ways to get better as the season progresses. They don't ever look the same or stay the same. And on the opposite end, bad teams find ways to lose. And Georgia is not a bad team, so they have not found a way to beat themselves. Auburn did not have enough in the tank to be able to knock Georgia off. They took them to deep water but they couldn't drown them. And right now, you got to suffocate Georgia. you got to put them down. They are the champ, and you got to knock the champ out. You can't go all rounds and think you're going to win by decision. That's not what happens at Georgia, especially here in Athens. It's just not going to happen. So you got to come in and knock this team out if you're going to try and unseed Georgia. And like I've said before, I will pick Georgia until they prove me wrong. So Kirby said this week that he thinks that every SEC team should be ranked. So what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I cover them, like, I don't have a vote. I mean, it's just funny to me how you lose and my man Matt Stenskong would say it best, all right? Who, who do they put in certain positions when they rank these teams to prop up other teams' wins and losses? And so right now the Pac-12 is sitting nice and you got all these other teams, but a win or a loss versus the right team props you up and makes you look a lot better than what you truly are. I think the SEC is always going to be competitive and they had two bad starts because they went 0-2 early with Alabama losing to Texas and then LSU losing to Florida State. Everybody's like, oh, they're not that good. Well, actually, those two teams are probably two of the top five teams in the whole country right now, and uh, they're going to be there at the end as well. So it's going to be really, really interesting to see. But the SEC will be just fine. You just got to win your games. If you win in the SEC, you're going to be right there in position to possibly be in the college football playoffs regardless of your record. When you turn on the tape, what do you see from Malachi Starks? What stands out about him? <clears throat> uh, he's big. He's a physical player. He's making more plays on the ball this year. Um, last year, I thought his angles in playing cover two and a back half safety were bad. He'd probably go too flat. He's looking at the ball, and this is pure safety talk. He's looking at the ball instead of finding his midpoint or his, his angle right off the, the receiver, and he's treating it like the quarterback's throwing him the ball and the quarterback's not throwing you the ball. And uh, that's something that safety's had to got to get used to with depth perception and understanding and being in the position a lot more. And right now, he's athletic. He makes all the plays in the world. That game, that interception last week to kind of seal it versus Auburn was a really big play. And uh, I don't think enough people give credit when the hardest thing as a DB about an interception is catching the football. And he did that in traffic. And uh, Auburn's receiver falling down helps. But uh, overall, uh, I really like this young man. I thought he was a really good player last year as a true freshman, and he will continue to be really, really good going forward. And I don't think you can give enough credit about Javon Bullard's impact on this defense, playing the nickel, playing some safety, the way he sets the run game, uh, sets the edge in run games. He's really good in that position and also a really good cover guy. I, I just really love the defensive backfield of the Georgia Bulldogs. Best uh, duo safeties one and then two. Uh, last year you were really high on JDJ, Jamal Dumas Johnson. Your thoughts on the inside linebacker play? How much has that affected? Uh, you know, uh, 
and the other one too, number two, uh, Smile London. Smile London. London as well. I mean, they're athletic and they still have rotation some kind of way. Georgia's still able to rotate more and more linebackers into the fold. Um, they're just really good. I love Jamin Dumas Johnson. He just flies around. He tackles so well in space and he hasn't had like this huge, huge impact like I felt he had it last year at times. And sometimes it's just all about the defense and the scheme the teams were playing. They don't allow you to make those plays, but he'll be just fine. I, I really, really like his game. Uh, he's a great commander of this defense and you got to be. You got to have a lot of checks. You got to be really, really smart to command the huddle uh, the way that he does, uh, the same way N'Kobe Dean did previously before him. So I, I think Georgia, if you want to be a great defensive guy and known and get drafted and play on Sundays, you come to Georgia right now. And that's a credit to what Kirby and this defense has been able to build.